from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to the world over. On this Thanksgiving edition, we want to thank you, all of you who regularly watch and allow us into your homes, and those of you joining us for the first time. We want to thank you, too. Normally, the news cycle tends to be slow this time of year, but over the weekend, some comments made by Pope Benedict XVI caused quite a firestorm. He was interviewed recently by German journalist Peter Seewald for a new book wherein he made some comments about the hypothetical use of condoms. The media has run wild with this story, but that everyone was attentive when a real papal document is released. To discuss and clarify the Pope's comments is theologian and papal biographer George Weigel. And later, I've told you about my latest project, a new Catholic dramatized audio Bible. Well, tonight, a closer look at the Truth and Life dramatized audio Bible. Producer Carla Mari and the great actor Stacy Keach will join me. Let's get started. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. This past weekend, Pope Benedict XVI elevated 24 prelates to the College of Cardinals. Among them, two Americans, Washington, D.C. Archbishop Donald Wuerl and Prefect of the Apostolic Signatura, or the Vatican Supreme Court, Archbishop Raymond Burke. Ten Italians were also named. The Holy Father told the newly appointed that the Church needs prelates who lead through humble service, that is, replacing human criteria for power and authority with the logic of the cross. The Pope also reminded the cardinals that the red color of the office signifies fortitude, even to the point of spilling your blood for the increase of the Catholic faith. And big step backwards for Sino-Vatican relations as Chinese authorities this past weekend proceeded with an illicit ordination of a bishop, ignoring strong protests from the Holy See. It was the first illicit bishop ordination there in nearly five years. According to reports, the communist regime sequestered three Vatican-approved consecrated bishops ahead of the ordination to pressure them into attending the ceremony. Hong Kong Bishop Emeritus Cardinal Joseph Zen. It's something incredible that at this moment, after so much effort, so much good will from the Holy See, they still to such act of, of uh, bullying. Eh? There's no, no good will on, 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 on the other part. It's incredible. It's a, for me, it's a declaration of war. Cardinal Zen further decried the kidnapping of bishops, adding that the huge display of a police force at the ordination reeked of, quote, a fascist method and gangster style that has brought shame on our noble country, end quote. Is marriage becoming obsolete in the United States? A new survey released by the Pew Research Center and Time magazine suggests that the nation is headed that way. According to the survey, about 30% of children under 18 now live with a parent or parents who are unwed or no longer married. That's an astonishing five-fold increase from 1960. The 30% is split evenly between divorced or separated parents and parents who never married in the first place. And indeed, when asked if marriage was becoming obsolete, 39% of respondents agreed. That's up from 28% in 1978. There was, however, a silver lining in the survey. In spite of the reported demise of marriage, 85% of youths are still planning to be married someday. Well, there's some good news. And the Archdiocese of San Antonio officially received their new shepherd. The most reverend Gustavo Garcia Siller was installed during a mass on Tuesday. He replaces Archbishop Jose Gomez, who earlier this year was made coadjutor of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Archbishop Garcia Siller previously served as an auxiliary bishop in Chicago. We want to extend our congratulations to the new Archbishop, as well as to the newest Americans wearing red this week, Cardinal Burke and Cardinal Wuerl. 
And despite media claims to the contrary, Pope Benedict XVI is not altering Catholic teaching on condom use or sexuality. Controversy and confusion has surrounded an excerpt from a new book-length interview with the Holy Father entitled Light of the World. In it, he was asked about condom use in the context of HIV prevention. Pope Benedict asserted that the Church does not regard condom use as, quote, a real or moral solution in dealing with HIV-AIDS. But then he engaged in some theological musings, which fueled the confusion. George Weigel will join us in a moment to help separate fact from fiction on this story. So stay right there. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay with us. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. Pope Benedict XVI caused quite a media firestorm this week when excerpts of an interview he granted for a new book, Light of the World, was made public. In the interview, the Pope considers the issue of condom use to combat AIDS in Africa. The world media is hailing it as a sea change in church teaching. But is it really? Here to shine light on all the confusion is theologian, author, and senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center here in Washington, D.C., George Weigel. George, thanks for being back on the program. I should say George recently released a second volume of his biography, the late John Paul II, entitled The End and the Beginning, Pope John Paul II, The Victory of Freedom, The Last Years, The Legacy. George, thanks for taking time out of the book tour to come and uh, shed some light on this. Let's acquaint people with these quotes in some context. The Pope was asked this question by Peter Seewald, the, uh, his journalist interlocutor on this, and uh, about the Africa situation. He says, clearly, we cannot solve the problem by distributing condoms. Much more needs to be done. But then later he says, there may be a basis in the case of some individuals, as perhaps when a male prostitute uses a condom, where this can be a first step in the direction of a moralization and a first assumption of responsibility on the way toward recovering an awareness that not everything is allowed and that one cannot do whatever one wants. But it is not really the way to deal with the evil of HIV infection. That can really lie only in a humanization of sexuality. Now, I I'll, we'll continue on in a moment, but react to that. What is he saying there? Many are interpreting this as a sea change in church teaching, is it? Well, it certainly is not a sea change in, in church teaching. Uh, perhaps I can shed some light on this by trying to illustrate the point with a less volatile example. Imagine you've got a bank robber, a habitual bank robber, and the bank robber decides, I'm going to keep robbing banks, but I'm going to use a gun that isn't loaded because I don't want to hurt anybody when I'm mm -hmm. robbing the bank. Now, we might say that's the beginning of some intuition of moral responsibility on the part of the bank robber. Church might well say that. Pope might well say that. But what we're certainly not saying is that it's a good thing to rob banks with blank guns. Mm -hmm. And we're certainly not saying the pope should, that the Pope and the Church should provide bank robbers with guns that can't be loaded with bullets. Uh, the Holy Father here is trying to draw a distinction, as I understand it, between the subjective intention of what is manifestly a disturbed, a morally disturbed personality, and objective act. This is a very difficult distinction to make in this media environment where the word condom has become a kind of frenzy word and a gotcha word. And, and, and so much of the coverage of this uh, for the past week has been kind of what I call gotcha coverage. Right. Ah, finally, you guys have gotten it. You understand. Mm -hmm. Pope clearly understands the research data, which indicates that the real AIDS preventers are abstinence outside of marriage and fidelity within marriage, and he goes through this in the book. Right. But you haven't heard a word of this. Yeah from a press world which, as our friend Bill McGurn wrote in the Wall Street Journal this week, is simply obsessed 
with condoms. Yeah. And this is an obsession that has to be challenged because its net effect is to get more people dead. No, he even says in the book, in the light of the world, he says uh, th there's a lot of condoms available. It doesn't seem to be working. So there must be another solution, and we have it. But then he goes on. I'm going to put the full screen of this up. And, George, isn't this the sort of thing that lends itself to misinterpretation by those who aren't perhaps as informed? Uh, Seawald asks the Pope, are you saying then that the Catholic Church is actually not opposed in principle to the use of condoms? The Pope responds, she of course does not regard it as a real or moral solution, but in this or that case there can be nonetheless in the intention of reducing the risk of infection a first step in a movement toward a different way, a more human way of living sexuality. Now, that, to my eye, doesn't seem like an endorsement of condoms, but many are reading that line as such. No, that, that's true. And I think that that section, in fact, illustrates beautifully this subjective, objective thing. The Pope is clearly saying, no, this is not a good idea to do this in itself, but in a certain circumstance, it might indicate that somebody's actually beginning to think in a more morally serious way. Mm -hmm. The real question here, Raymond, is whether in the kind of... 24-7 soundbite media environment mm -hmm. in which we live, which you simply cannot pretend does not exist. Whether it was prudent to try to have this discussion or initiate this discussion in this way. Mm -hmm. And judging from the results, I think one has to say it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to have the kind of discussion, the serious discussion, Mm -hmm. uh, that the Pope wishes under these circumstances. Well, he clearly wants to engage. I mean, we have this new papal congregation on engaging, new evangelization and engaging the culture where it is. But when we see this kind of media coverage, he's being steamrolled. No one's hearing him because one line has been pulled out and distorted, and then it's filled with innuendo from so-called informed sources. For instance, Pope... Con condoms okay for women with HIV, too. This from MSNBC. Uh, the Associated Press, everyone can use condoms to prevent HIV. Uh, th the one that sent me over the edge, though, was the APTN story. This is the Associated Press television feed. And in it, they quote Father Lombardi, the Vatican spokesman, where he said at the press conference on Tuesday, I personally asked the Pope if there was a serious, important problem in the choice of the masculine over the feminine, meaning the male prostitute referred to in his example. He, he told me the problem is this. It's the first step of taking responsibility, of taking it into consideration, the risk of a life of another person with whom you are having a relationship. This is if you're a woman, a man, or a transsexual. Now you see headlines coming out saying, transsexuals, it's okay to use condoms. What, what, what is the lesson here, George? Well, one of the lessons, uh, Raymond, is that the communications apparatus of the Holy See is in complete disarray. Uh, no one has been able to provide illustrations or examples of the sort I just tried, which actually, I think, make this make some sense mm -hmm. to people who are not technical specialists in moral philosophy or moral theology. The absolutely ridiculous focus on a branch of the trees rather than the forest here. Right. This question is, is he talking about male prostitutes, female prostitutes, transsexual? I mean, yeah. This is utterly beside the point. Did, did you think he chose the example of a male prostitute? I mean, my guess on it uh, that I've written was that he chose it because it doesn't involve conception. And therefore, the only reason you use the condom in that example would be to prevent disease from, from being passed. I, I have no idea why this was chosen, and I frankly have no idea why it is in the book, because <laughs> this is not the kind of vehicle for this kind of discussion, mm -hmm. it seems to me. You are inevitably going to be misinterpreted, misreported, and then the spiral down mm -hmm. to a kind of, hey, the Catholic Church is endorsing lesser evils approaches to these grave moral problems uh, becomes inevitable. Uh, so I, there's another thing we might want to touch on here as well, and that is that this utter obsession for three, four, five days with two paragraphs in a 200-page book is ignoring the rich 
discussion of a, a virtual endless list of interesting issues in the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. And I think that tells us something deeply disturbing about the media culture in mm -hmm. which uh, we live. Well, this it, is not all, I should say, a media problem. Mm -hmm. Vatican communications have been horrible on this, uh, and that has to be uh, acknowledged. But it also has to be said time and again that the world press's insistence on salvation through latex in the matter of AIDS is a death-dealing obsession. The empirical evidence that we have demonstrates that the Pope was right in what he said in Africa two years ago about abstinence and fidelity within marriage as the proven preventers of this horrible disease. And the refusal of the world press to acknowledge that is a terrible thing. And there are about six paragraphs in this book where he says just that before he makes these comments that have been twisted and mangled. But George, here's the Associated Press piece, Nicole Winfield's piece. In it, she quotes Father James Martin, a Jesuit editor and writer, and he says, this is a game changer. changer. By acknowledging that condoms help prevent the spread of HIV between people in sexual relationships, the Pope has completely changed the Catholic discussion on condoms. Your thoughts on that? That is grotesque spin on the part of Father Martin. It is not what the Pope said. And it has no basis in empirical reality. Let Father Martin go back to the op-ed piece published by Harvard's Ted Green in the Washington Post after the Pope was in Africa. Dr. Green is not a Catholic, yeah. describes himself as a, man, as a man of the left, and said the Pope was right mm -hmm. about abstinence and fidelity as AIDS preventers. Mm -hmm. I find it reprehensible that someone like Father Martin would spin this statement for his ideological purposes. Mm. Uh, then you have at the Vatican press conference on Tuesday, uh, Peter Seewald was there, as were various Vatican officials. Also attending was a journalist, uh, Luigi Acatoli, and he says, the Holy Father cautiously and courageously, Benedict XVI, seeks a pragmatic way in which missionaries and other ecclesial workers can help defeat the AIDS pandemic without approving, but also without excluding, in particular cases, the use of a condom. Luigi Cattoli was the uh, Vaticanista for Corriere della Sera, the New York Times of Italy, as it's often called for many years. Uh, he's retired. Uh, I used to regard him with some respect as a Vaticanista who did not make things up, which is a temptation within that tribe rarely uh, <laughs> resisted. Uh, but in this case, too, he, these people simply haven't done the empirical research uh, on what works and what doesn't in driving down the incidence uh, of AIDS. Uh, and I don't understand why ill-informed people are brought into a press conference uh, like this to present the Pope's book. There are numerous Americans familiar with these issues. Ted Green, whom I mentioned a yeah. moment ago, yeah, the who could research. have been invited in. What is going on here? Yeah. Why are we having a little in-group party which is then misrepresenting both facts and the text itself? And being spun as the truth of what the Pope actually intended from the Vatican's own platform. Let's back it up to, to Saturday, last Saturday, when Elizabeth Torre Romano ran and broke the embargo on this book, offering this little choice slim paragraph that I read at the very end there. How did that serve this cause? It didn't serve it at all. It was a mindless uh, decision on the part of La Servatore Romano, uh, which has not been helpful uh, over the past several years in bringing out the genuine message of this pontificate uh, and in engaging the culture. Uh, this, is a, this is another part of this Vatican communications problem that has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons I fear it isn't addressed is that most people in the Vatican don't take La Servatore Romano seriously. Huh. Therefore, if no one's paying attention, then when the Vatican newspaper is running articles on how The Simpsons yeah. is a Homer deeply Simpson Catholic, is really Catholic. Catholic show, yeah. everybody just sort of shrugs. Well, okay, that's okay when you're dealing with The Simpsons, but when you make a genuinely mindless decision, Mm -hmm. uh, of the kind they made to excerpt those materials, 
then I think somebody has to be held accountable for that mm -hmm. and a very serious rethinking of how that newspaper functions has to start taking place. Tell me the difference because I think a lot of people misunderstand this. If the Pope is sitting for an interview and let's say, let's concede the point, let's say he said, which he didn't say, condoms are perfectly acceptable for everybody, in the course of an interview, does that rise to the level of the normal magisterium? No. Distinguish for no. people. Uh, this is, we've been through this with John Paul II and with Benedict XVI uh, in his Jesus of Nazareth book. Now this is a slightly different circumstance. Uh, because at the beginning of Jesus of Nazareth, the Pope says, I'm speaking as Joseph Ratzinger, a theologian and biblical scholar. Right. People are free to disagree with this. Uh, in light of the world, the Pope is speaking man to man with Peter Seewald, which he has done on two previous occasions and produced beautiful books out of that, as indeed Light of the World is a beautiful right. book uh, and very much deserves uh, to be read. Uh, I think the danger in this all the way along uh, is of a media which assumes that every utterance out of the papal mouth mm -hmm. has the same cash value, if you will, mm -hmm. or magisterial value, and the failure of the Vatican communications apparatus mm -hmm. to make clear that there's a spectrum of seriousness here, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, and that, uh, I mean, the other thing that, that I just find bizarre in the, in the press coverage of this is the assumption that, let's say for the sake of argument, the Pope intended to reverse right. a long-standing right. Catholic understanding about these matters, that he would do it through an interview with a journalist. Yeah, it's I ridiculous. mean, I'm sorry, boys and girls of the Fourth Estate, you are not the vehicle yeah. for the magisterium of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and you ought to learn that. Well, as I said earlier, but that they would pay so much attention to the official papal documents that come out of any pontificate. You know, those are ignored out of hand. Pope just issued a very moving apostolic exhortation reflecting on the role of the Bible in the life of the church. Nobody paid the slightest attention. Mm -hmm. Nobody paid the slightest attention. But here we are obsessing on salvation yeah. by latex. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to some more uplifting topics that Please. the book covers. In it, he talks about his recent practice of distributing communion in the mouth, on the tongue, rather than reception in the hand. And uh, in the book, I'll read this very quickly. He said, I wanted it to be clear, something quite special is going on here. He is here, the one before whom we fall on our knees. Pay attention. This is not just some social ritual in which we can take part if we want to. So again, the sign reinforcing the reality here. This has teaching. been a constant theme of Joseph Ratzinger's commentary on the so-called reform of the reform of the liturgy mm -hmm. uh, for the better part of 25 years now. Uh, the reduction of uh, Holy Mass to a social engagement in which the self-worshipping community tells itself how wonderful it is, uh, is a theme that he has been pressing for a long time. He believes that the act of the priest himself acting in the person of Christ, offering the body of Christ to the communicant, and not having that taken and often carried away and eaten on the run. So yeah, he said, I've seen people slip as, it in their wallet as, as, as a as memento. As if this were a potato chip or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think he's raising an important uh, point here. Mm -hmm. People can receive Holy Communion in the hand very reverently. We've all seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a matter of fact, this practice has, I think, contributed throughout the church unintentionally mm -hmm. to a kind of desacralizing of the right as have any number of other things that he's determined to reverse. Mm -hmm. uh, he also talks here about his age, very candidly, at 83, uh, that he feels his powers diminishing and that the, the schedule really overtaxes an 83-year-old man. Your thoughts on this as the biographer of Pope John Paul II, who, in addition to his age, had all sorts of infirmities upon him at this, uh, at this moment. I've known the present pope since 1988, and he's been worried about his diminishing powers <laughs> for 22 years. Uh, he seems to me to be in remarkable form for an 83-year-old man. Mm -hmm. The lucidity of his mind, as evident in this book in its full range, mm -hmm. uh, is quite stunning and, and deeply impressive. Uh, if the schedule is more than he feels comfortable with, then he should adjust the schedule. He's the mm -hmm. boss, and he can mm -hmm. do that. Uh, uh, 
so I don't think that's to be regarded as any uh, premonition or prediction mm -hmm. of an imminent uh, demise. Mm -hmm. uh, just to wrap this up, what do you think Pope John Paul II would have made of all of this? And would this kind of communication snafu taken place in that pontificate? Well, it didn't. I mean, John Paul II wrote a semi-similar book, uh, That's true. Crossing the Threshold of Hope. Mm -hmm. It wasn't quite the kind of give and take you have in light of the world, but it was the Pope's response to answers posed by the Italian journalist Vittorio Massori. And there was some pretty chunky stuff in there, some mm -hmm. potentially volatile material in there. For example, when uh, John Paul II described Islam right. as a religion which is very far from us in its view of God and its view of the human person, even though he went on to express great admiration for the piety of many uh, Muslims. Now, had someone wanted to make something of that, mm -hmm. I suspect that Dr. Joaquin Navarro Valls, the Pope's press spokesman, would have had that conversation, that discussion, uh, under much better control than has been evident in this really depressing, almost keystone cops kind of communications apparatus mm -hmm. we've seen in the Vatican in recent weeks. Do you think it will improve? I'm afraid its improvement uh, is not likely in the short term, mm -hmm. although I devoutly hope that the Holy Father himself and those around him take this in hand not because it's creating media flaps. The media is going to get in a flap when the media wants right. to get into a flap. The problem is it's impeding the evangelical work of the church. Mm -hmm. If this is a pontificate that is trying to draw out the new evangelization announced by John Paul II, it has to have instruments to do that mm -hmm. when the Pope's voice and the authentic voice of Catholic teaching can be heard clearly. Impeding that means people have to go and people who know how to carry that message across have to be put in. It's also very difficult to reset a narrative once it has been broadcast repeatedly, and that's what I think we're facing now with this condom story, at least. Uh, I, I think that's exactly right, and I expect to be explaining to people five years from now <laughs> that Benedict the Sixteenth did not do a 180-degree shift in the Catholic Church's uh, teaching about the ethics of human love. Mm -hmm. this, this is something we're going to be straightening out, unfortunately, for a very long time to come. Well, George Weigel, I hope you'll stop talking about male prostitutes and transsexuals very <laughs> soon. Thank you, George. The End and the Beginning is available at bookstores everywhere. Uh, it's a great read, a great Christmas gift, and the EWTN's religious catalog is carrying it. You can get it there. When we return, you haven't heard the scriptures until you've heard them like this. The Truth and Life Dramatized Audio Bible, the first Catholic dramatic Bible, hits bookshelves this week. Carla Mari and actor Stacey Keach will tell us about it when the world is alive. Continue. Stay right there. Thanks for okay. oh, it's, it's, uh, I think we... Then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that attended it. Amen. Welcome back to The World Over Live. That was Blair Underwood performing the Gospel of Mark. Over the last few weeks, I've been talking to you about my latest project, The Truth and Life Dramatized Audio Bible. It is the only Catholic, fully dramatized, word-for-word -word audio Bible available anywhere. It's a dramatic rendition of the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition, the so-called Ignatius Bible. A terrific cast of internationally renowned actors bring the scriptures to life, including my guest tonight, the great actor of stage and screen, Stacy Keach. Carla Mari, the CEO of Falcon Picture Group, co-produced the Truth and Life Dramatized Audio Bible with me, and he joined me recently in studio. Carl, it was uh, fantastic working with you, and this was... Uh, 
partially your vision that brought, and certainly your work that brought this to completion. Why did you feel we needed an audio Bible like this uh, of this revised standard version, the Catholic edition? Well, I, there isn't one, first of all. There's, there's not a dra dramatized Catholic audio Bible, and I thought there should be one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I'm a big believer in audio. I love audio drama. I love uh, the, the art form that is radio drama. And I thought, why not take, to me, one of the greatest mediums and match it with the greatest story ever told, the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a personal thing for you. I mean, there was a, there was a personal story that sort of motivated you to, yeah. to do this. What was it? Well, having children, three children, we, we read that, uh, to them the Bible. Mm -hmm. And... One night, uh, my son said to me, what is that, Dad, what does that mean? And I had a hard time explaining. It was part of the Old Testament. I was, I was actually a little uh, <laughs> perplexed. mystified, yeah. perplexed. And so I thought, you know, I really, I really need to know more about uh, and understand the word because it is confusing sometimes. Mm -hmm. And being a fan of radio drama and having licensed thousands of radio shows over, over my career... And loving radio shows like Gunsmoke and The Lone Ranger and The Shadow and Jack Benny. And uh, you, re you rehabbed a lot of those old shows, those old radio dramas that people will remember, right? Yeah. Um, um, I, I was very fortunate to, to get to know um, Stacy's father, Stacy Keach's father, who uh, produced the series Tales of the Texas Rangers. Really? George Burns, um, Milton Berle. Um, these legends of, of, of that, of the golden age of radio. Mm -hmm. And I licensed the radio shows and put them back on the air on hundreds of radio stations and put them out on, uh, at the time, cassette tape, mm. which is... You're dating yourself, <laughs> Which is no Carl. more, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then CD. And so I just fell in love with the medium. I fell in love wa with radio drama and how it matched with the great performances and music and sound effects, how that mm -hmm. theater of the mind mm -hmm. is so powerful. And so I thought, why don't I take both of my loves, the Bible and radio drama and marry mm -hmm. the two. Yeah, the, what I love about this audio Bible is uh, it is not your run-of-the-mill kind of single narrator Bible, right. which, uh, you know, I often call that, this is an audio Bible you can, you know, get in an accident to. Not <laughs> this one. This is lively. The, the, you have the sound effects that creep in throughout. Right. There's an original score, 70 actors, and some world-class actors here right. uh, bring their best game to the table. Among them, one of my favorites, Stacy Keach, who's joining us from New York. Stacy, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure. Now, now Stacy, I, I was uh, thrilled to see you recently here in Washington, D.C. You did an incredible production of King Lear, and I've seen you so many times in, in film and television and on stage. What drew you to a project like this, to this Truth in Life audio Bible? Well, you know, what uh, I was listening to what you were talking with Carl about, and uh, I, I certainly concur with what he said. One of the things I think is, is, is important is that people who, who rely on the Bible for spiritual sustenance oftentimes have a priest or somebody in their domain that is unable to interpret the Bible in terms of, or to give the Bible a kind of life, a kind of excitement, a kind of drama that, it, that it, it has when you read it. And the great thing that Carl has done is he's given us actors who are able to dramatize the, uh, the stories of the various people that they're portraying in, in, the, in the context and in the landscape of a, a radio show. It's almost like a visual, an audio movie. It's like <clears throat> when you listen to it, it comes, it comes to life in a way that it's impossible for it to come to life in either church or Bible school. Uh, and I think Bible schools probably will, will use Truth or Life, I'm sure they will, as a matter of fact, as a means of teaching. Because it not only entertains, but it also teaches. It also gives you uh, an insight into the Bible in a way that we've never heard before. Mm -hmm. I want to give people a little preview. This is a little audio clip of Stacy Keach as John. And when we come back, we'll talk about your playing this role. Here's Stacy Keach performing the Gospel of John. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went toward the tomb. They both ran. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, 
he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying, and the napkin which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not know the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Uh, Stacy, how did you prepare for a role like this? Well, the first thing you do, of course, is you go to the book. <clears throat> you read the book, and then you read the scholarship surrounding it as much as you possibly can. I mean, you could spend a lifetime reading the scholarship surrounding the Bible. There's no question about that. But I was very concerned. The, the thing that I wanted to do with John, I wanted to make him uh, personal, intimate, because he was Jesus' best friend. And I wanted to convey that sense of his devotion and his uh, objectivity. And I wanted to make sure that there was a differentiation between John in the Gospel, in the book of John, and Revelations. But I didn't want Revelations to be a, a, a doomsday uh, scenario. I didn't, I've never felt that it, I mean, a lot of people interpret it that way. <clears throat> but I think that the images in Revelations are so startling that they're awe-inspiring. They, they create a sense of, of ma majesty and, and uh, uh, mystery uh, and absolute... Uh, the, the, kind of, the kind of awe that I think <clears throat> is very much akin to a feeling of spirituality. Right. No, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, in, in your interpretation of it too, uh, in, in those words, there's a lot of prefigurement of the mass and uh, the ritual that would come uh, from the Catholic faith. And you hear that in your particular rendition. It is not the kind of um, on-the-nose, gloom-and-doom uh, account that one expects when you, you encounter yeah. the words of, of Revelation. I know it. Well, it's, a, it's an astonishing book. And I mean... I think the images of Christ with a sword have baffled scholars even to, to this day. Uh, Stacy, I want to play you. You referenced Jesus uh, a little earlier, as we would talking about the Bible. I want to give people a little taste. Uh, this is Neil McDonough, uh, who's a yes. fantastic actor who plays the role Wonderful of Jesus actor. in the Truth and Life dramatized audio Bible. Uh, here he is in the studio. Behold, I am coming soon bringing my recompense to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Carl, tell me about uh, the casting of Neil McDonough. Why him? Uh, our, the audience will remember in recent days he was on Desperate Housewives and then he was cast in a television series. I think it was an ABC series. And they wanted him to take part in a sex scene, and he refused, largely because of his Catholic faith. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. It was all over the news, and it just happened to be at a time that I was <laughs> honing in on who do I want to cast as Jesus. And uh, this big Variety article came out about how he walked away literally from millions of dollars because he would not do a provocative scene and as the lead in this series uh, and saying because he is a devout Catholic and family man, and he just won't do it. Mm -hmm. So they fired him. Mm -hmm. um, and I called his agent uh, right around that time and, and told uh, her what we were doing. And she said, let me, let me take it to him. And within 10 minutes, she called back and yeah. said he would absolutely love and be a dream come true to play the role. No, no, for Neil, this was obviously a yeah. labor of love. I mean, you hear it in the performance yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, tell me about some of the other actors here. Uh, Blair Underwood, uh, who's in the nice. event on mm -hmm. NBC, yes. a fantastic yes. actor, great voice. He plays the role of Mark. Why yes. Blair for that role? Um, well, Blair is a good friend of mine and, and, um, and a devout uh, Christian, and so I, I called on him and asked him if he, would, if he would do this, and he said yes immediately. I mean, he loves uh, the, the Lord, and he loves uh, radio drama, yeah. And it was an easy yes for him. Yeah, and Michael York, who we've worked with before, yes. uh, is uh, Luke, uh, yep. narrates Luke. Now, let, let's talk about the particular approach, and then I want to bring Stacy back in. 
uh, all of these actors who are playing the apostles, they are narrating, in essence, their own account, right. their own gospel. Right. 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 Why, why that approach? Um, well, I just think it's, uh, I mean, it's fascinating for them to tell the story through their eyes, mm -hmm. and, um, but then be part of the story as well. Um, and it's, it's just great. I think, I think that's really the way it should be. I, I didn't want to have a narrator telling mm -hmm. the story. I wanted the person telling the yeah. story. Stacy, uh, it's one of the things I love about the, the, this Truth in Life audio Bible, and your performance uh, stands out so starkly in that each actor who plays one of these apostles really brings mm. a new personality and their own stamp to the story. Even though you hear the same mm. story, in essence, four times, it's through different right. eyes. Uh, were you conscious of that as you approached this, that you know, the, the no. audience would have heard this story twice by the time it gets to you? No, because I think that we have to create it as if it's the first time and the only time. Even though there are references, slight references, uh, you know, with Luke and Mark and John. But no, I, John, for me, stand, stands alone. I, the interesting thing is uh, that the Bible, the, 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 those men were all different. And I think one of the great things about having different people playing those roles is that that difference is accentuated and, and you, it's easy to distinguish between the different interpretations of the same story from these different points of view. Mm -hmm. uh, Stacy, tell me, you are a Christian man. I know you, you, you have your own yes. faith. How has this deepened your faith, taking part in this well, project I think and playing it, the Apostle John? It's, it's, uh, every time I have the, the, the opportunity to, to get into a biblical character and do the research and uh, revisit those words, I think it, it, it's an inspiration. And it, it, it absolutely inspires and, and strengthens and supports my faith, um, it makes it, it grows, it grows. And I think the same thing happens when you listen. I, I was listening the other night to uh, The Truth in Life, to some other parts that I wasn't involved with, and I, I found it deeply inspiring, deeply inspiring and very, very satisfying in terms of being spiritually consoling. Mm -hmm. You know, it draws you in. What I love about it is it puts you in the present moment. Yeah. Mother Angelica, who founded this network, often talked about living in the present moment. When you hear these actors performing these characters and all the, the sound effects, the, the, the original score, the other actors coming in, there is a sense that you're in the middle of the action. And as one of the reviews I read recently said, it's, it's not overproduced. It's just enough to be real. Well, that's, that's key because um, when you're dealing with these words, mm -hmm. you want the words to be heard first. Right. I mean, the words are the most important thing. And when you use world-class actors like Stacey Keach, Michael Jesus York, Blair Underwood, the there um, the hillside. you know, they, they bring something to it that, that just, a, just uh, a person reading cannot. Um, you accentuate that with just the right amount, uh, amount of sound effects and, and, a, and a beautiful score, which is an original score. It's right. scored like a film. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, a, it's super powerful because it's, uh, it's a landscape. Your imagination is a landscape that's boundless. Mm -hmm. So you're there. You really are there when you're listening. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Okay. How long did this take to uh, produce th this from this start to This was a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Year and a half from start to finish, and I and I have to I just have to really uh, say that the director Brenda Noel mm -hmm. um, is uh, a Bible scholar, and mm -hmm. she also had theologians uh, at her um, beck and call, consulting, and 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 really helped the actors because you know the inflection. Uh, you can say the words one way. If the inflection is wrong, it's, it's, it's all wrong. Well, and the pronunciation of some of these yes, names. Yes. Just, you know, oh. this one begat that one, begat that one, begat that one. I mean... Poor Sean, poor, poor Sean Astin. Yeah, oh, yeah poor Sean <laughs> Astin. Matthew. Had the whole litany. Yeah, he had the whole Matthew litany there. He does there. a great job. No, it's, it's, it's an exceptional uh, project. And, um, Stacy, how difficult was it for you? Because this is not a... Um, a dramatization that takes liberty with the Gospels. It is no. word for word the Revised Standard uh, Version Catholic Edition. Uh, that had to be a bit of a challenge as an actor, right? 
Well, yes and no. Yeah, it, it, definitely a challenge in the sense that you want it to be clear and eloquent and re reflect the poetry that exists, I think. In, 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 but it's also, it also liberates you from having to improvise. I think anytime you do something, it's, I mean, Shakespeare's is very much in the same mode. You don't, you know, you don't mess around with the words there. You play the words the way they're written, and they work, and they do work. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, in your voice, they really work. I mean, it's, it's one of my, oh, my favorite uh, gospels. I was listening to it in the car, and, you know, I, uh, we play it for our kids, and we're mm -hmm. driving uh, with all of the commuting we all yeah. do. And living in Washington, it's mm -hmm. an hour to get, mm -hmm. you know, to the mm -hmm. grocery and back. Uh, and we'll put it on for the kids, and they're really drawn in oh, yeah. in a way that, mm -hmm. you know, I put other single narrator Bibles on, and they're, you know, like, like the driver, they're sleeping. Uh, this really draws them in and I, I think holds their attention. Is that well, what you've it makes it, it, it really makes it fun to listen to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, these are great stories, and when you get to see them in your imagination, kids absolutely uh, are, are drawn to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Stacy, uh, when, when you were working on this, did you have a sense of the, the power of proclaiming these words? I think so often they're confined to the page and people begin to think of them in a bookish way. Uh, mm. To my mind, they don't really come to life until they're out of the mouth of a living human being and hopefully someone who knows what to do with them. Right. Well, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, we, we tried, <clears throat> what I tried, and I know the other actors, many of the other actors work in the same way, to make it as personal as possible and uh, to create it as if it were happening at the moment so that these are not words that uh, were written down... Ten, uh, a thousand, two thousand years ago, and are now being proclaimed. These are words that are being created on the spot as it happens. This is uh, you're in the midst of the evolution and the the birth of these words from these particular people, so that they're, you're hearing them for the first time. Mm -hmm. No, and, and that, that, that stands out from this production. Stacy, before we let you go, tell us what you're doing next and uh, where people can see you. Well, I'm just getting... I'm in rehearsal for a play in New York at Lincoln Center, a new play by John Robin Bates called Other Desert Cities. A uh, wonderful play uh, about a Republican family living in Palm Springs in 2004. And they... They talk about a, a tragic event in their lives 28 years earlier where their son rebelled against all the values of the family and uh, was a long-haired hippie, went out and bombed a, a Marine recruiting station, killed a man, and then presumably committed suicide. The daughter has come back to the house in Palm Springs on Christmas, at Christmas time, to reveal that she has written a book about this and she's going to publish this book, which causes the family to go into an uproar. We're very excited about it. We start previews on the 16th of December. We open January 13th, and we play until the end of February. Lincoln Center's Mitzi Newhouse Theater. Fantastic. Well, I'm excited to see it now. So I'll be seeing you in New York Good. before long, Stacey. And, of course, so many remember you as uh, Mike Hammer. And uh, I've heard right. Carl has even a, a set of audio productions, new adventures of Mike Hammer that I know you we all have. Uh, yes, we just finished years, a new adventure. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Encore yeah, so for that's murder. That's something to look forward to. Stacy Keach, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. And uh, let, b before we go, Carl, uh, just with you, what are your long-term hopes for a project like this? I mean, I know you didn't do this just for one season. You want right. this to go on, I imagine. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I well, I'd love to do the Old Testament next, mm -hmm. um, and I, I that will probably take three to four years to do mm -hmm. it. Um, we're we're starting to think about that now, mm -hmm. and I just I just hope that that families will gather together and listen to this as a mm -hmm. unit. You know, back in the golden age of radio, I always thought it was fascinating. I didn't grow up during the golden age of radio, mm -hmm. but my parents used to say, you know, we used to huddle around the radio and have we'd have supper, and then huddle around the radio and listen to Ozzy and Harriet or Jack Benny. And I hope people will do that with with this mm -hmm. because it is it's the New Testament. But it's also a radio drama. You know, a lot of Catholics think they've heard these words. They mm -hmm. sit in Mass, they listen to them, a little bit mm -hmm. is read each week. I can tell you, after listening to this and uh, being in on, on the editing of this, listening to the actors shape these performances, 
when you hear these words in the mouths of actors who have thought deeply about them, there's a new light that is almost turned yes, on. Yes. Yes. And um, you know this. You know this product particularly has it has the endorsement of Archbishop Dolan of New York, now the president of the Bishops Conference, right. uh, Cardinal Bremen Burke uh, in uh, in uh, Rome, and an intro by the Pope. I mean, it's really. Uh, a, a, a first-class product and uh, something I, I know you're proud. And of. I have to, and I have to thank B Media because B Media uh, lived this with me. B Media in, in in the Chicago area, they had all of their engineers. They, they had we had about 20 engineers working on this for a year and a half, and uh, a magnificent studio that that did all of the editing and put this all together. And I want to thank Jim McLean and, and everyone at B Media. Before we go, I want to share with you a little clip of Michael York as Luke. Just listen to this before we go. For many demons had entered him, and they begged Jesus not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them leave. That's Michael York as Luke, one of the many great performances on this Bible. Uh, Sean Astin and uh, John Rhys Davies of the Lord of the Rings fame uh, also took part in this audio Bible. Julia Ormond is just wonderful as Mary, uh, the mother of God. You can see clips of some of those performances at Truth and Life Bible. Dot com. The Truth and Life Dramatized Audio Bible is available at bookstores everywhere and online, but you can only get the special EWTN edition with Mother Angelica's scripture teachings through EWTN's religious catalog. If you go to RaymondArroyo.com, R-A-Y-M-O-N-D-A-R-R-O-Y-O.com, the banner up top will take you directly to the catalog. You can order it there. Well, that's all the time we have until next week. You can find updates and the occasional commentary by following me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Raymond Arroyo or on my Facebook fan page. And Christmas is coming. To that end, the prayers and personal devotions of Mother Angelica is still in bookstores. It makes a great Christmas gift. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Happy Thanksgiving. And thanks for watching. Bye.